Chapter 15 of The Life of Thomas Lord Cochrane, Tenth Earl of Dundonald, Volume 1, by Henry Richard Fox Bourne. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Timothy Ferguson. 1826 to 1827. Lord Cochrane, having passed from Brussels to Flushing, sailed thence in the Unicorn on the 8th of May, 1826. Before proceeding to the Mediterranean, he determined, in spite of the personal risk, he would thus be subjected to, through the Foreign Enlistment Act, to see for himself in what state were the preparations for his enterprise in Greece. He accordingly landed at Weymouth, and hurrying up to London, spent the greater part of Sunday, the 16th of May, in Mr. Galloway's building yard at Greenwich. He found that the perseverance was apparently completed, though waiting for some finishing touches to be put to her boilers. The other two vessels, he said, were filled with pieces of the high-pressure engines, all unfixed, and scattered about in the engine room and on deck. The boilers were in the small boats, and occupied nearly one half of their length. Mr. Galway, having through inattention or otherwise, caused them to be made of the same dimensions as the boilers for the great vessels, which, by the by, had been improperly increased from sixteen feet, the length determined on, to twenty-three feet. The inspection was unsatisfactory, but Mr. Galway pledged himself on his honour that the perseverance should start in a day or two, that the enterprise in the irresistible should be completed and sent to sea within a fortnight, and that the other three vessels should be out of hand in less than a month. Trusting to that promise, or at any rate, hoping that it might be fulfilled, and after a parting interview with Sir Francis Burdett, Mr. Elise, and other friends, Lord Cochrane left London on Monday and joined the Unicorn at Dartford on the 20th of May. It had been arranged that he should wait in British waters for the first instalment of his little fleet, at any rate, with that object, he called at Falmouth, and receiving no satisfactory information there, went to make a longer halt in Bantry Bay. At length, hearing that the Perseverance had actually started with Captain Hastings for its commander, and that the other two large vessels were on the point of leaving the Thames, he left the coast of Ireland on the 12th of June. He vainly hoped that the vessels would promptly join him in the Mediterranean, and that within four or five weeks' time he should be at work in Greek waters. The journey, however, was to last nine months. The mismanagement and willful delays of Mr. Galway and other contractors and agents continued as before. The urgent need of Greece was unsatisfied, the funds collected for promoting her deliverance were wantonly perverted, and the looked-for deliverer was doomed to nearly a year of further inactivity, hateful to him at all times, but now a special source of annoyance, as it involved not only idleness to himself, but also serious injury to the cause he had espoused. He passed a Porto on the 18th, Lisbon on the 20th, and Gibraltar on the 26th of June. He was off Algiers on the 3rd of July, and on the 12th he anchored in the harbour of Messina. There, and in the adjoining waters, he waited nearly three months in daily expectation of the arrival of his vessels, Messina having been the appointed meeting place. No vessels came, but instead only dismal and procrastinating letters. Quote, we deeply lament, wrote Messrs. J. and S. Ricardo, the contractors for the Greek loan, in one of them dated the 9th of September, that after all the exertions which have been used, we have not yet been able to dispatch the two large steam vessels. Everything has been ready for some time, but Mr. Galway's failure in the engines will now occasion a much longer detention. We leave to your brother, who writes by the same opportunity, to fully explain to your lordship how all this has arisen, and what measures it has been considered expedient to adopt. In the whole of this unfortunate affair, we have endeavoured to follow your wishes, and our conduct toward Mr. Galway, who has much to answer for, has been chiefly directed by his representations. Galway is the evil genius that pursues us everywhere, wrote the same correspondence on the 25th of September. His presumption is only equalled by his incompetency. Whatever he has to do with is miserably deficient. We do not think his misconduct has been intentional, but it has proved most fatal to the interests of Greece and of those engaged in her behalf. On your lordship it has pressed peculiarly hard, and most sincerely do we lament that an undertaking which promised so fairly in the commencement should hitherto have proved unavailing, and that your power of assisting this unhappy country should have been rendered nugatory by the want of means to put it in effect. End quote. Those letters and others written before and after did not reach Lord Cochrane till the end of October. In the meanwhile, finding that the expected vessels did not arrive at Messina, and that in that place it was impossible even for him to receive accurate information as to the progress of affairs in London, he called at Malta about the middle of September, and thence proceeded to Marseilles as a convenient holding place in which 
he had better chance of hearing how matters were proceeding, and from which he could easily go to meet the vessels when, if ever, they were ready to join him. He reached Marseilles on the 12th of October, and on the same day he forwarded a letter to Messrs. Ricardo. Quote, I wrote to you a few days ago, he said, from Malta, and as the packet sailed with a fair wind, you will receive that letter very shortly. You will thereby perceive that distressing suspense in which I have been held, and the inconvenience to which I have been exposed by remaining on board this small vessel for a period of five months during all the heat of a Mediterranean summer without exercise or recreation. This situation has been rendered the more unpleasant, as I have had no means to inform myself except through the public papers relative to the concern in which we are now engaged. My patience, however, is now worn out, and I have come here to learn whether I am to expect the steam vessels or not, whether the scandalous blunders of Mr. Galway are to be remedied by those concerned, or if an ill-timed parsimony is to doom Greece to inevitable destruction, for such will be the consequence if Ibrahim's resources are not cut up before the period at which it is usual for him to commence operations. You know my opinions so well that it is unnecessary to repeat them to you. I shall, however, add that the intelligence and plans I have obtained since my arrival in the Mediterranean confirm these opinions and enable me to predict with as much certainty as ever I could do on any enterprise that if the vessels and the means to pay six months' expenses are forwarded, there shall not be a Turkish or Egyptian ship in the archipelago at the termination of the winter. It may have been expected that I should immediately proceed to Greece in this vessel. I might have done so at an earlier period of my life, before I proved by experience that advice is thrown away upon persons in the situation and circumstances in which the Greek rulers and their people are unfortunately placed. Having made up my mind on this subject, I must entreat you to let me know, by the earliest possible means, what I am to expect in regard to the steamships. I see by the globe of the second of last month that the holders of Greek stock were to have a meeting. I conclude they came to some resolution and this resolution I want to know. I wish I could give them my eyes to see with. They would then pursue a course which would secure their interests. This, however, is impossible, therefore they must, like the Greeks, be left to follow their own notions. I have, however, no objections to your stating to these gentlemen, either publicly or privately, that I pledge my reputation to free Greece, if they will, by the smallest additional sacrifice that may be required, put the stipulated force at my disposal." End quote. Readers note footnote. This letter, like some others of this nature, is partly written in cipher, the key to which is lost. Its concluding sentences, therefore, are not given. End footnote. At Marseilles, Lord Cochrane received information, disheartening enough, though more encouraging than was justified by the real state of affairs, with reference to his intended fleet. On the 14th of October, he wrote to explain his position, as he himself understood it, to the Greek government. Quote, by the most fortunate accident, he said, I have met Mr. Hobhouse here, who, from his correspondence with Messrs. Ricardo and others in London, enables me to state to you that the two large steamboats will be completed on the 28th day of this month, and that they will proceed on the following day for the rendezvous which I had assigned to them previous to my departure. You may, therefore, count on them being in Greece around the 14th of next month. The American frigate is said to be completed and on her way, and I feel a confident hope that I shall be able here to add a very efficient ship of war to the before-mentioned vessels. It is probable, he added, that many idle reports will be circulated, here and through the public prints, because, under existing circumstances, I find it necessary to appear now as a person travelling about for private amusement. I can assure you, however, that the 160 days which I have already spent in this small vessel without ever having my foot on shore till the day before yesterday, has been a sacrifice which I should not have made for any other cause than that in which I am engaged, but I considered it essential to conceal the real insignificance of my situation and allow rumours to circulate of squadrons collecting in various parts, judging that the effect would be to embarrass the operations of the enemy. End quote. Readers note footnote. It should be here explained that the building and fitting out of two frigates contracted for in New York at the cost of £150,000, having been assigned to persons whose mismanagement was as scandalous as that which perplexed the Greek cause in London, one of them having been sold, and with the proceeds and some other funds, the other having been completed and fitted out, more than £200,000 having been spent upon her, she reached Greece at the end of 1826, there to be known as the Hellas. Footnote ends. 
that concealment had to be maintained, and the wearisome delays continued for three months more. All the promises of Mr. Galway, and all the efforts, real or pretended, of the Greek deputies in London were in vain. The completion of the steam vessels was retarded on all sorts of pretexts, and when each little portion of the work was said to be done, it was found to be so badly executed that it had to be cancelled and the whole thing done afresh. In this way, all the residue of the loan of 1825 was exhausted, and all for worse than nothing. Lord Cochrane would never have been able to proceed in Greece at all had the deputies Orlando and Luriotis, who had been contracted for his employment, been his only supporters. Fortunately, however, he had other and worthier coadjutors. The Greek committee in Paris did much on his behalf, and yet more was done by the Philhellenes of Switzerland, with Chevalier Aynard at their head, of whom one zealous member, Dr. L. A. Goss of Geneva, quote, well informed, very zealous, full of genuine enthusiasm for the cause of humanity and an excellent physician, end quote, as Monsieur Aynard described him, was about to go in person to Greece as administrator of the funds collected by the Swiss committee. Lord Cochrane's disconsolate arrival at Marseilles and the miserable failure of the plans of his enterprise had not been known to Monsieur Aynard and his friends a week before they set themselves to remedy the mischief as far as lay in their power. As a first and chief movement, they proposed to buy a French corvette then lying in Marseilles harbour and fit her out as a stout auxiliary to Lord Cochrane's little force, expected from London and New York. Lord Cochrane, being consulted on the scheme, eagerly acceded to it in a letter written on the 25th of October. Quote, as I have yet no certainty, he said, that the person employed to fit the machinery of the steam vessels will now perform his task better than he has heretofore done, I recommend purchasing the corvette, provided that she can be purchased for the sum of 200,000 francs, and if funds are wanting, I am personally willing to advance enough to provision the corvette and am ready to proceed in that or any other fit vessel. But I am quite resolved, without a moral certainty of something following me, not to ruin and disgrace the cause by presenting myself in Greece in a schooner with two carronades of the smallest calibre. End quote. The corvette was bought and equipped, but in this several weeks were employed. In the interval, for a week or two after the 8th of December, Lord Cochrane went to Geneva, there to be the guest of Chevalier Aynard, to be introduced to Dr. Goss, and to become personally acquainted with many other Philhellenes. Neither Lord Cochrane nor his friends could quite abandon the hope of the ultimate completion of the London steam vessels. They felt, too, that with nothing but the new vessel, the American frigate, and the Perseverance, Lord Cochrane would have very poor provision for his undertaking. Quote, I have this moment received a letter from his lordship, wrote Monsieur Aynard to Mr. Hobhouse on the 12th of January, 1827, wherein he appears rather disappointed with respect to the scantiness of the forces and the means placed at his disposal. He informs me that he has no officers, few sailors, and that, in case the steamer should not arrive, he will not feel qualified to encounter the Turkish and Egyptian naval forces, as well as the Algerines, who, of all, are the best manned. I therefore shall not be able to undertake anything of moment, continues his lordship. Thus to stake my character and existence would be a mere chaotic act. I will put to sea, however, but still with a heavy heart, yet not until I have with me all requisites and my stores and ammunition be embarked likewise. Discouragement appears throughout his lordship's letter. End quote. This discouragement is not to be wondered at. It is hardly necessary, however, to give further illustration of it, or of the troubles incident to this long waiting time. Enough has been said to show Lord Cochrane's position in relation to this deplorable state of affairs, and to exonerate him from all blame in the matter. That he should have been blamed at all is only part of the wanton injustice that attended him nearly all through his life. He had consented in the autumn of 1825 to enter the service of the Greeks, on the distinct understanding that six English-built steamships should be placed at his disposal and to facilitate the arrangements he did and bore far more than could have been expected of him. For the delays and disasters that befell those arrangements he was in no way responsible. He was only thereby a very great sufferer, but his sufferings would have been greater and he would have been really at fault had he consented to go to Greece without any sort of provision, as few rash friends and many eager enemies desired him to do and afterwards blamed him for not doing. As it was, he greatly increased his difficulties by at last proceeding to Greece with the miserable equipment provided for him. In his little schooner, the Unicorn, he left Marseille on the 14th of February, 1827, and proceeded to saint Trapezi, where the French corvette, the Salveur, was being fitted out under the direction of Captain Thomas, a brave and energetic officer. Thence he set sail with the two vessels on the 23rd of February. He reached Poros and entered upon his service in Greek waters on the 19th of March. Quote, 
He had been wandering around the Mediterranean in a fine English yacht, purchased for him out of the proceeds of the loan, in order to accelerate his arrival in Greece ever since the month of June 1826, end quote, says the ablest historian of the Greek Revolution. The preceding paragraphs will show how much truth is contained in that sarcastic sentence. End of chapter 15. Recording by Timothy Ferguson, Gold Coast, Australia. Chapter 16 of The Life of Thomas, Lord Cochrane, Tenth Earl of Dundonald, Volume 1, by Henry Richard Fox Bourne. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Timothy Ferguson, 1826 to 1827. During the one and twenty weary months that elapsed between Lord Cochrane's acceptance of service in the Greek War of Independence and his actual participation in the work, the revolution passed through a new and disastrous stage. In the summer of 1825, when the invitation was sent to him, the disorganisation of the Greeks and the superior strength of the Turks, and yet more of their Egyptian and Arabian allies under Ibrahim Pasha, were threatening to undo all that had been achieved in the previous years. One bold stand had begun to be made, in which, throughout nearly a whole year, the Greeks fought with unsurpassed heroism, and then the whole struggle for liberty fell into the lawless and disordered condition which had already prevailed in many districts, and which was then to become universal, and to offer obstacles too great, even for Lord Cochrane's genius to overcome, in his efforts to revive genuine patriotism, and to render thoroughly successful the cause that he had espoused. The last great stand was at Messalonghi, built on the edge of a marshy plain, bounded on the north by the high hills of Zygos, and protected on the south by the shallow lagoons at the mouth of the Gulf of Lepanto, and chiefly tenanted by hardy fishermen. This town had been the first in western Greece to take part in the revolution. Here, in 1821, nearly all the Muslim residents had been slaughtered, the wealthiest and most serviceable only being spared to become the slaves of their Christian masters. In the two months of 1822, the Ottomans had made a desperate attempt to win back the stronghold, but its inhabitants led by Mavrocordatos, who had lately come to join in the work of regeneration, had resolutely beaten off the invaders and taken revenge upon the few Turks still resident among them. Quote, the wife of one of the Turkish inhabitants of Missolonghi, said an English visitor in 1824, imploring my pity, begged me to allow her to remain under my roof in order to shelter her from the brutality and cruelty of the Greeks. They had murdered all her relations, a little girl, nine years old, remained to be the only companion of her misery. Missolonghi continued to be one of the chief strongholds of independence in continental Greece, and the revolutionists, being forced into it by the Turks, who scoured the districts north and east of it in 1824 and 1825, it became in the latter year the main object of attack and the scene of most desperate resistance. Here were concentrated the chief energies of the Greek warriors and of their Moslem antagonists, and here was exhibited the last and most heroic effort of the patriots, unaided by foreign champions of note in their long and hard-fought battle for freedom. Rashid Pasha, the ablest of the Turkish generals, having advanced into the neighbourhood of Messalonghi toward the end of April, began to besiege it in good earnest at the head of an army of some seven or eight thousand picked followers on the 7th of May. While he was forming his entrenchments and erecting his batteries, the townsmen, augmented by a number of fierce Suliots and others, were strengthening their defences. They increased their ramparts and organised a garrison of 4,000 soldiers and armed peasants, with a 1,000 citizens and boatmen as auxiliaries. At first the tide of fortune was with them. The Turks had to defend themselves as best they could from numerous sorties, well planned and well executed in May and June, and fresh courage came to the Greeks with the intelligence that Admiral Miaulis was on his way to the port with as powerful a fleet as he could muster. While he was being expected, however, on the 10th of July, the Turkish captain Pasha of Greece arrived with 55 vessels. Miaulis, with 40 Greek sail, made his appearance on the 2nd of August. Thus the naval and military forces of both sides were brought into formidable opposition. At first the Greeks triumphed on the sea, in the night of the 3rd of August, Miaulis, finding that Missolonghi was being greatly troubled by the blockade established by the Turks, cleverly placed himself to windward of the enemy's line, and at daybreak on the 4th, he dispersed the squadron nearest the shore. At noon, the whole Turkish force came against him. 
he met them bravely but being able to do no more than hold his own by the ordinary method of warfare he sent three fireships against them in the afternoon the turks did not wait to be injured by them they fled at once going all the way to alexandria in search of safety Mialis then lost no time in seconding his first exploit by another a detachment of the army of eastern greece under the brave generals karasakas and zevelas having been sent to harass rashid pasha's operations the admiral assisted them in a successful piece of strategy the turks were on the sixth of august attacked simultaneously by the ships and by the outlying battalions of greeks while fifteen hundred of the garrison rushed out upon the invaders four turkish batteries were seized and a great number of their defenders were killed and captured the remainder after tough fighting during three hours and a half being driven so far back that much of the besieging work had to be done over again mialis then went in search of the ottoman fleet leaving the townsmen who were enabled by the raising of the blockade to receive fresh supplies of food ammunition and men to continue their defence with a good heart Rashid Pasha vigorously restored his siege operations, but attempting to force his way into the town on the 21st of September was again seriously repulsed. The Turks were allowed, and even tempted, to advance to a point which had been skilfully undermined by the besieged. The mine was fired, and a great number of Muslims were blown into the air, while their comrades, fleeing in disorder, were further injured by a storm of shot from the ramparts. A similar device was resorted to with like success on the 13th of October, Rashid had to retire to a safe distance, and there build winter quarters for his diminished and starving army. Karaskakes and Zavellas entered Missolonghi without hindrance, there to concert measures which, had they been promptly adopted, might have utterly destroyed the besieging force. They delayed their plans too long. The captain Pasha, having in August fled in a cowardly way to Alexandria, there effected a junction with the Egyptians and returned to the neighbourhood of Missolonghi in the middle of November, with a huge fleet of 135 vessels, well supplied with troops and provisions. These he landed at Patras on the 18th, just in time to be free from any annoyance that might have been occasioned by Mialis, who returned to Missolonghi on the 28th, with a fleet of only 33 sail. He had vainly attacked part of the Moslem force on its way, and now, after landing some stores at Missolonghi, made several vain attempts to overcome a force four times as strong as his own. He soon retired, intending to return as promptly as he could collect a large fleet and bring with him further supplies of the provisions of which the missolongites were beginning to be in need the need was greater even than he had imagined not only had the captain pasha brought temporary assistance in men and food to the besieging force yet greater assistance soon came in the shape of an egyptian army led by ibrahim pasha himself an overwhelming power was thus organised during the last weeks of 1825, and the defenders of Missolonghi were left to succumb to it almost unaided. Their previous successes had induced the Greeks of other districts to believe that they could continue their defence alone, and almost the only relief obtained by them was from the Xantiots, who had all along been zealous in the dispatch of money and provisions, and from Mialaus and the small fleet and equipment that he was able to collect from the islands of the archipelago. Mialis returned in January 1826 and did much injury to the Turkish and Egyptian vessels, but he could offer no hindrance to the actions of the Turks and Egyptians upon land. The rainy months of December and January, in which no important attack could be entered upon, were spent by Ibrahim with his companions in preparation for future work. The invaders were now well provided with every requisite. The besieged were in want of nearly everything. Quote, Invested for ten months, says the contemporary historian, frequently on the verge of starvation, thinned by fatigue, watching, and wounds, they had already buried fifteen hundred soldiers. The town was in ruins, and they lived amongst the mire and the water of their ditches, exposed to the inclemency of a rigorous season, without shoes in their tattered clothing. As far as their vision stretched over the waves, they beheld only Turkish flags. The plain was studded with Mussulman tents and standards, and the gradual appearance of new batteries more skilfully disposed. The field days of the Arabs, and the noise of saws and hammers, gave fearful warning. Yet these valiant Acananians, Italians, and Epriots never flinched for an instant. On the 13th of January, Ibrahim Pasha sent to say that he was willing to treat with them for an honourable surrender, if they would convey their terms by deputies who could speak Albanian, Turkish, and French. Quote, we are illiterate and do not understand so many languages, was their blunt reply. Pashas we do not recognise. 
but we know how to handle the sword and the gun. End quote. Sword and gun were handled with desperate prowess during February and March, and the early part of April. In April, offers of capitulation were renewed by Ibrahim, and more disinterested attempts to avert the worst calamity were made by Sir Frederick Adam, the Lord High Commissioner of the Ionian Islands. Both proposals were stoutly rejected. The Missalongites declared that they would defend their town to the last, and trust only in God and their own strong arms. But on the 1st of April, the last scanty distribution of public rations was exhausted. For three weeks the inhabitants subsisted upon nothing but cats, rats, hides, seaweed, and whatever other refuse and vermin they could collect. At length, on the 22nd of April, finding it impossible to hold out for a day longer, they resolved to evacuate the town in a body, and cutting their way through the enemy, to try and join Karaskakis and his small force, who, hiding among the mountain fastnesses, were vainly seeking for some way of assisting them, and to whom they now dispatched a message, asking them to advance and help clear a passage for their flight. After sunset, four bridges of planks were secretly laid over the outer ditch of Missolonghi, and the inhabitants were ordered to prepare to leave in two hours. Many, about two thousand, lost heart at last, some betaking themselves to the powder stores, there, when all help was over, to end their lives by easier death than the enemy might allow them. Others, crouching in the corners of their homesteads, deeming it better to be murdered there than in the open country. The rest obeyed the orders of their generals. All the women dressed themselves as men, with swords or daggers at their waists. Every child who could hold a weapon had one placed in his hand. There was bitter leave-taking, and desperate words of encouragement passed from one to another, as the patriots were marshalled in the order of their departure. Three thousand fighting men to open a passage, and four thousand women and children to follow, the whole being divided into three separate parties. At length all was ready, and the first party silently passed out of the town and advanced to the bridges. To their amazement, they no sooner appeared than they were met by volley after volley of Turkish fire. Traitor had revealed their plan, and every measure had been taken for their destruction. Some rushed on in despite, others hurried back to fall into confusion, which it was hard indeed to overcome. They felt, however, that this deadly chance was their only chance of life, and they pressed on through the fire and the swords of their foes, and, by the sheer heroism of despair, forced a passage to the mountains. Karaskaki's aid, apparently through no fault of his, was only obtained when the worst dangers had been surmounted or succumbed to. Of the 9,000 persons who were in Messalonghi on the day of the evacuation, 4,000 were killed in the town, or on the way out of it. Only 1,300 men and 200 women and children lived to reach Salona after more than a week of wandering and hiding among the mountains. The long siege of Missolonghi illustrates all the best and some of the worst features of the Greek Revolution. In it there was patriotism worthy, in its bursts of splendour, of the nation that claimed descent from the heroes of Plataea and Thermopylae. But the patriotism was often fitful in its working, and oftener wholly wanting. The Greeks could not shake off the pernicious influences that sprang almost necessarily from their long centuries of thraldom. Heroism was closely linked with treachery and meanness. The worthiest and most disinterested energy was intimately associated with ignorance as to the right methods of action, and with willful action in wrong ways. The elements of weakness that had been apparent from the first were more and more developed as the painful struggle reached its termination. It seems as if, in spite of Rashid Pasha and Ibrahim and their fierce armies, it would have been easy for Missolonghi and its brave defenders to have been saved, but rival ambitions and petty jealousies divided the leaders of the revolution. They were quarrelling, while the power that each one coveted for himself was step by step being wrested from them all, and when they tried to do well, their want of discipline often rendered their efforts of small avail. No adequate attempt was made to relieve Messalonghi by land, and the brave conduct of Mialis on the sea was almost neutralised by the disorganisation of his crews and the selfish policy of the islanders who sent him out. Quote, With respect to the Greek army, wrote General Ponsonby to the Duke of Wellington from Corfu on the 15th of June, it is, generally speaking, a mob, and a chief can only calculate upon keeping it together as long as he has provisions to give it, or the prospect of plunder without danger. There is nothing to oppose the Egyptian army but a mob kept together by the small sums sent by the different committees in foreign countries. The Greeks have a great horror of the bayonet, which, however, they have never seen near except at Missolonghi. The Suliots, who chiefly form the garrison of that place, are fine men, and certainly fought with great courage. Much has been said of naval actions, but there is no truth in any of the accounts. The Greeks are better sailors than the Turks, 
but no action has been fought since the beginning of the war, if it is understood by action that there is risk and loss on both sides. The Greeks, however, have done wonders with their fleet. They have destroyed many large ships, and in the month of February last, with 23 brigs, they outmanoeuvred the Turkish fleet of 60 sail and threw provisions into Messalongi. This, though done by seamanship and not fighting, was called a great battle and a great victory. I was within two miles of the fleets, and the cannonade for six hours was tremendous, but when I spoke to Mialis the following morning, he told me he had not lost a man in his fleet. End quote. During the summer and winter following the fall of Missolonghi, a series of small disasters, the aggregate of which was by no means small, befell the Greeks. It was the opinion of all parties, and even admitted by jealous rivals, that the tottering cause of independence was only sustained by the constant and eager expectation of the arrival of the powerful fleet, which was supposed to be on its way to the archipelago, under the able leadership of Lord Cochrane, the world-famous champion of Chilean and Brazilian freedom. His approach was hardly more a cause of hope to the Greeks than a subject of fear to the Turks. No sooner was it publicly known that he had espoused the cause of the insurgents than angry complaints were made by the Turkish government to the British ministry, and Mr. Canning, then Foreign Secretary, had more than once to avow that the authorities of England knew nothing of his movements and had done all that the law rendered possible to restrain him. He had also to promise that everything legal should be done to keep him in check on his arrival in Greek waters. Quote, we have heard, he wrote in August to his cousin, Mr. Stratford Canning, afterwards Lord Stratford de Redcliffe, the ambassador to Constantinople, that Lord Cochrane is gone to the Mediterranean. Whether it be really so, we know not. End quote. He then proceeded to define the bearing of English and international law in the existing circumstances. Quote, Lord Cochrane may enter the Greek service and continue therein. He may even, as a Greek commander, institute, as he did in Brazil, blockades, which British officers will respect and exercise the belligerent rights of search on British merchant ships without exposing himself to any other penalty than that which the law will inflict upon him if ever hereafter he shall again bring himself within its reach and be duly convicted of the offence for the punishment of which that law was enacted. If, indeed, he should do any such things without a commission, he would become a pirate and liable to the summary justice to which, without reference to the municipal laws of his country, he would as an enemy of the human race, be liable, and liable just as much from the officers of any other country as his own. End quote. While that correspondence was going on, Lord Cochrane, as we have seen, was battling with a long series of delays, as irksome to himself as they were to the unfortunate Greeks. It was not until the 14th of September, about eight months after the time fixed for the arrival of his whole fleet, that the first instalment of it, the Perseverance, which had been sent on as soon as it was completed, with Captain Abney Hastings as its commander, entered the harbour of Nauplia. On the 26th of October, Captain Hastings wrote a letter giving curious evidence of the estimate formed by him of the Greek character. It was left at Nauplia and addressed to, quote, the commander of the first American or English vessel that arrives in Greece to join the Greeks. An apprenticeship in Greece, tolerably long, he wrote, has taught me the risks to which anybody, newly arrived and possessed of some place and power, is exposed. They know me, and they also know that I know them, yet they have not ceased, and never will cease, intriguing to get this vessel out of my hands and into their own, which would be tantamount to ruining her. Knowing all this, I take the liberty of leaving this letter to be delivered to the first officer that arrives in Greece in the command of a vessel, to caution him not to receive on board his vessel any Greek captain." They will endeavour, under various pretences, to introduce themselves on board, and, once they have got a footing, they will gradually encroach until they feel themselves strong enough to turn out the original commander. The presence of such men can only be attended with inconvenience, for, if you are obliged to take a certain number of Greek sailors, these captains will render subordination among them impossible by their own irregularity and bad example. If you want seamen, take some from Hydra, Spetsas, Cranidi, or Poros. The Sarans may be trusted in very small numbers, Take a few men from one, a few from another island, and thus you will be best enabled to establish some kind of discipline. Take a good number of marines, choose them from the peasantry and foreign Greeks, and you may make something of them. You must see, sir, that in this, my advice to the first officer arriving in command of a vessel, I can have no interest any further than inasmuch as I wish well to the Greek cause, and therefore do not wish to see a force that can be of great service rendered ineffective by falling into the hands of people totally incapable and unwilling to adopt a single right procedure. In Greece there cannot be any military operations except such as are carried out by foreigners in their service. 
End quote. That letter was written after Captain Hastings had endured a month's annoyance from the trouble brought upon him by the Hydriot officers and seamen who tried to oust him from the command of his fine vessel, whose name was now changed from the Perseverance to the Caterina. Unfortunately, his letter, left at Nauplia, did not reach the captain of the next reinforcement, the American frigate, which arrived at Aegina on the 8th of December. Quote, she was one of the finest ships in the world, we are told, carrying 64 long guns, long 32-pounders on the main, and 42-pound carronades on the upper deck, and filled with flour, ammunition, medicines, and marine stores for 18 months' consumption. The Greeks contemplated her with delight, but upon the departure of the American officers and seamen who navigated her out, they discovered that she would be more embarrassing than useful to them. To manage vessels of such size was beyond their capacity, and the mutual jealousy of the islanders suggested to the government the absurd notion of putting the frigate into commission, Hydra, Spetsaz, and the Sarin community being desired to send quotas of men. This plan was now found to be impracticable. Repeated fights occurred on board. The ship was twice in danger of being wrecked at Aegina, and at Poros she actually drifted ashore, luckily on soft mud. She was finally given up to Miaulis with a Hydriot crew of his own selection. This frigate, christened the Hellas, came too late to be of much service to Admiral Miaulis before the arrival of Lord Cochrane. In the previous summer and autumn, however, he had been harassing and keeping at bay the Turkish and Egyptian fleets, work in which Hastings was in time to assist him. Andreas Miaulis, one of the least obtrusive, was almost the worthiest of all the Greek patriots. During five years he had never ceased to do the best that it was possible for him to do with the bad materials at his disposal. When the Greek Revolution was at its height, he had contributed largely to its success, and in the ensuing years of disaster upon land, he had maintained its dignity on the sea by offering bold resistance to the great naval power of the combined Turkish and Egyptian fleets. No better proof of his patriotism could be given than the zeal in which he surrendered to Lord Cochrane the leadership of the fleet, which had devolved upon him for so long, and been so ably conducted by him. Quote, I received four days ago, he wrote from Poros on the 23rd of February, 1827, your amiable letter of the 19th of last month, and my great satisfaction at the announcement of your approaching arrival in Greece is joined with a special pleasure at the honour you do me and associating me with your important operations. I shall be happy, my admiral, if in serving you I can do my duty. I await you with impatience. End quote. Just a month before that, on the 23rd of January, a like letter of congratulation was addressed to Lord Cochrane from Aegina by the Governing Commission of Greece. Quote, the intelligence of your speedy coming to Greece, they said, has awakened the liveliest joy and satisfaction, and has already begun to rekindle in the hearts of the Greeks the enthusiasm which is the most powerful weapon and the surest support of a nation that has devoted itself to the recovery of its most sacred rights. The government of Greece is waiting with the utmost impatience for the most zealous defender of the nation's liberty. It hopes to see you in its midst as soon as possible after your arrival at Hydra, and then to make you acquainted with the actual state of Greece, and to furnish you with all means in its power for the achievement of the grand results proposed by your lordship. End quote. The letter was signed by Andreas Zames as president of the commission, and by seven of its members, among whom were Mavra Michaelis, or Petro Bay, who, with Zames and two others, represented the Maria, Spiridion, Trucupes, the deputy for Rumelia, Zamados from Hydra, Monarchides from Sara, and Dramitricopolis from the islands of the Aegean Sea. By the same body was issued, on the 21st of February, a preliminary commission intended to protect him in case of any opposition being raised to his progress by the authorities of other nations. Quote, the Governing Commission of Greece, it was written, makes known that Admiral Lord Cochrane is recognised as being in the service of Greece, and accordingly has the permission of the government to hoist the Greek flag on all the vessels that are under his command. He has power also to fight the enemies of Greece to the utmost of his power. Therefore, the officers of neutral powers, being informed of this, are implored not only to offer no opposition to his movements, but also, if necessary, to supply him with any assistance he may require, seeing that it is our custom to do the same to all friendly nations. End quote. Armed with this document, and provided with the necessary means by the Philhellenes of England, France, and Switzerland, Lord Cochrane proceeded from Marseille to Greece. End of chapter 16. Recording by Timothy Ferguson, Gold Coast, Australia. Appendix 1 of The Life of Thomas, Lord Cochrane, 10th Earl of Dundonald, Volume 1, by Henry Richard Fox Bourne. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 
Recording by Timothy Ferguson. Appendix 1. The following resume of services of the late Earl of Dundonald, none of which have been requited or officially recognised, was written by his son, one of the authors of the present work, and presented for private circulation in 1861. 1. The destruction of three heavily armed French corvettes near the mouth of the Garonne, the crew of Lord Cochrane's frigate Pallas, being at the time, with the exception of forty men, engaged in cutting out a tapagus, lying under the protection of two batteries thirty miles up the river, in which operation they were also successful, four ships of war being thus captured or destroyed in a single day. For these services, Lord Cochrane obtained nothing but his share of the tapagus, sold by auction for a trifling sum, the government refusing to purchase her as a ship of war, though of admirable build and construction. Contrary to the usual rule, no ship ever taken by Lord Cochrane throughout his whole career was ever allowed to be brought into the navy. For the corvettes which Lord Cochrane destroyed with so small a crew, he never received reward or thanks, the alleged reason being that, having become wrecks, they were not in existence, and therefore could not have value attached to them. This decision of the Admiralty was contrary to custom, as admitted to the present day. In the late Russian war, a gunboat of the enemy having been driven on shore and wrecked, compensation is said to have been awarded to the officers and crew of the British vessel which drove her on shore. The importance of wrecking a gunboat in comparison with the destruction of three fast sailing ships, which were picking up our merchantmen in all directions, needs no comment. Two Lord Cochrane services on the coast of Catalonia, of which Lord Collingwood, then Commander-in-Chief in the Mediterranean, testified of his lordship to the Admiralty that by his energy and foresight he had, with a single frigate, stopped a French army from occupying eastern Spain. The services by which this was effected were as follows. Preventing the reinforcement of the French garrison in Barcelona by harassing the newly arrived troops in their march along the coast, and organising and assisting the Spanish militia to oppose their progress. Lord Cochrane himself capturing one of their forts on shore and taking the garrison prisoners. On the approach of a powerful French corps d'armée towards Barcelona, Lord Cochrane blew up the roads along the coast and taught the Spanish peasantry how to do so inland. By blowing up the cliff roads near Mongat, Lord Cochrane interposed an insurmountable obstacle between the army and its artillery, capturing and throwing into the sea a considerable number of field pieces so that the operations of the French were rendered nugatory. For these services, Lord Cochrane, notwithstanding the strong representations of Lord Collingwood to the Board of Admiralty, neither received thanks nor reward of any kind, notwithstanding that whilst so engaged, and that voluntarily in successfully accomplishing the work of an army, he patriotically gave up all chances of prize money, though easily to be obtained, by cruising after the enemy's vessels. In place of this, he neither searched for, nor captured a single prize, whilst engaged in harassing the French army on shore, devoting his whole energies towards the enterprise, which he considered most conducive to the interests of his country. 3. Having effected his object, Lord Cochrane sailed for the Gulf of Lyons, with the intention of cutting off the enemy's shore communications. This he accomplished by destroying their signal stations, telegraphs, and shore batteries along nearly the whole coast, navigating his frigate with perfect safety throughout this proverbially perilous part of the Mediterranean. In order to further paralyse the enemy's movements, Lord Cochrane made a practice of burning paper near the demolished stations so as to deceive the French into the belief that he had burned their signal books, he rightly judging that from this circumstance they might not deem it necessary to alter their code of signals. The ruse succeeded, and transmitting the signal books to Lord Collingwood, then watching the enemy's preparations in Toulon, the commander-in-chief was thus fully apprised by the enemy's signals, not only of all their naval movements, but also of the position and movements of all British ships of war on the French coast. Lord Cochrane's single frigate thus performed the work of many vessels of observation, and Lord Collingwood testified of him to the Admiralty that his resources seemed to have no end. Notwithstanding this testimony from the commander-in-chief, Lord Cochrane received neither reward nor thanks for the service rendered. For, on his return to the Spanish coast, Lord Cochrane found the French besieging Rosas. The Spaniards maintaining possession of the citadel, whilst Fort Trinidad had just been evacuated by the British officer, who had been cooperating with the Spaniards in the larger fortress. Lord Cochrane, believing that if Fort Trinidad were held till reinforcements arrived, the French must be compelled to raise their siege of Rosas, persuaded the Spanish governor not to surrender, as he was about to do, on its evacuation by the British officer of Horsed, 
and threw himself into the fort with a detachment from the seamen and marines of the Imperieuse, with which frigate he maintained uninterrupted communication in spite of the enemy, who, on ascertaining it to be Lord Cochrane, who was keeping them at bay, redoubled their efforts to capture the fort, the gallant defence of which is amongst the most remarkable events of naval warfare. Lord Cochrane held Fort Trinidad till the Spaniards surrendering the citadel. He would not allow his men to run further risk in their behalf, and withdrew the seamen and marines in safety. For this remarkable exploit, Lord Cochrane, though himself severely wounded, neither received reward nor thanks, except from Lord Collingwood, who again, without effect, warmly applauded his gallantry to the Admiralty. 5. Immediately on his arrival at Plymouth, on leave of absence, in consequence of ill health from his extraordinary exertions, Lord Cochrane was immediately summoned by the Admiralty to Whitehall, and asked for a plan whereby the French fleet in Basque Roads, there threatening our West India possessions, might be destroyed at one blow. This extraordinary request from a junior captain, after the most experienced officers in the Navy had pronounced its impracticability, forcibly proving the very high opinion entertained by the Admiralty of Lord Cochrane's skill and resources, he gave in a plan, and was ordered to execute it, which order he reluctantly obeyed, having done all in his power to decline an invidious command for fear of arousing the jealousy of officers to whom he was junior in the service. What followed is a matter of history, and needs not be recapitulated, yet, for the destruction of that powerful armament, he neither received reward nor thanks from the Admiralty, though rewarded by his sovereign with the highest order of the bath, a distinction which marked His Majesty's sense of the important service rendered." Nine years afterwards, head money was awarded to the whole fleet, of which only the vessels directed by Lord Cochrane, and a few sent afterwards, when too late for effective measures, took part in the action. The alleged reason of this award was that the Calcutta, one of the ships driven ashore by Lord Cochrane, did not surrender to him, but to ships sent to his assistance. This was not true, though after protracted deliberation, so ruled by the Admiralty Court, and officers now living and present in the action, have recently come forward to testify to the ship being in Lord Cochrane's possession, before the arrival of the ships which subsequently came to his assistance. A small sum was therefore only awarded to him as a junior captain, in common with those who had been spectators only, and this he declined to receive. Such was his recompense for a service to the highest merit, of which Napoleon himself afterwards testified in the warmest manner, and it may be mentioned as a further testimony that a French court-martial, shot Captain Lafont, the commander of the Calcutta, because he surrendered to a vessel of inferior power, viz. Lord Cochrane's frigate, the Imperieuse of 44 guns, the Calcutta carrying 60 guns. Footnote. Captain Lafont was shot on board the Ocean on September the 9th, 1809, for surrendering the Calcutta to a ship of inferior force, thus proving that she surrendered to Lord Cochrane alone, though Sir William Scott ruled in opposition to the facts adopted by the French court-martial, which condemned Captain Lafont to death for the act. The surrender to Lord Cochrane alone is further proved by the additional fact that the captains of the Ville de Varsovie and Aquilon, which did surrender to the other ships in conjunction with Lord Cochrane's frigate, were not even accused, much less punished, for so doing. Footnote ends. The exploits of Lord Cochrane in the Speedy and the Palace are too well known in naval history to require recapitulation, and of these it may be said that the numerous prizes captured by these vessels constituted their own reward. It may here be mentioned, in confirmation of what has previously been said, that the Gamo, a magnificent Zebek frigate of 32 guns, was not allowed to be bought into the navy, but was sold for a small sum to one of the piratical Barbary states, notwithstanding that Lord Cochrane had said that if he were allowed to have her in place of the Speedy, then in a very dilapidated condition, he would sweep the Mediterranean over the enemy's cruisers and privateers. His capacity so to do may be judged from what he effected with the Speedy, mounting only fourteen four-pounders. With regard to the services previously enumerated, the case is different, notwithstanding their national importance in comparison with his minor acts, which may be classed as brilliant exploits only but that no reward should have been conferred for doing effectively the work of an army, and that without the cost of a shilling to the nation, beyond the ordinary expenditure of a small frigate, necessary to be dispersed whether she performed any effective service or not, is a neglect which, unless repaired in the persons of his successors, will forever remain a blot on the British government. Still more so will the worse neglect of not having in any way rewarded him for the destruction of the French fleet in Basque Roads, for though only four ships were destroyed at the moment, the whole fleet of the enemy was so damaged, by having been driven on shore from the terror of the explosive vessel, 
fired with Lord Cochrane's own hand, that it eventually became a wreck, and thus our West India commerce, then the most important branch of national export and import, was in a month after Lord Cochrane's arrival from the Mediterranean, relieved from the panic which paralysed it, and restored to its wanted security, a service which can only be estimated by the gloom and panic which had previously pervaded the whole country. Were reference made to the pension list, and note taken of the pensions granted to other officers and their successors, for services which, in point of national importance, do not admit of comparison with those of Lord Cochrane, the present generation would be surprised at the national ingratitude manifested towards one who, in his great exploits, had so patriotically sacrificed every consideration of private interest to his country's service. His cruise in the Imperieuse, which has no parallel in naval history, procured for Lord Cochrane nothing whatever but shattered health from the incessant anxiety and exertion he had undergone in the profitless but high-minded course he adopted to thwart the French in their attempts to establish a permanent footing in eastern Spain. His exploits in Basque roads procured him nothing but absolute ruin, for, from his refusal as a member of Parliament to acquiesce in a vote of thanks to Lord Gambier, even though the same thanks were promised to himself, may be dated that active political persecution which commenced by depriving him of further naval employment and did not cease till it had accomplished his utter ruin even to striking his name out of the navy list the animosity of this political partisanship towards one who had effected so much for his country is an anomaly even in political history that amended representation of the people in parliament for which he strove up to eighteen eighty eight had only fourteen years afterwards become the law of the land and the boast of some who had persecuted Lord Cochrane, for no offence beyond having been amongst the first to give expression to the popular will, subsequently adopted by themselves. The efforts of Lord Cochrane in favour of reforming the abuses of the Navy, and of Greenwich Hospital, which at that time brought upon him the wrath of the administration, are at this moment seriously engaging the attention of Parliament, as being of paramount national necessity. The doctrine then openly laid down that no naval officer in Parliament had a right to interfere with naval administration, has long been abrogated, and many of the brightest ornaments of the Navy are now, amongst the foremost, to denounce naval abuses in the House of Commons. It is, in fact, to them, that the country now looks for that vigilance which shall preserve the Navy in a proper state of efficiency, yet for these very things was Lord Cochrane persecuted. Though modern governments, which have been liberal enough to acquiesce in popular reforms, of which he was the early advocate, have not been liberal enough to make him amends for the wrongs he suffered as one of the indefatigable originators of their now cherished measures. Still less have they deemed it inconsistent with the honour of this great country to refrain from rewarding him in the ordinary manner for his most important services, rendered when others shrank from them, as was the case at Basque Roads, where his plans declined by his seniors in the service, were successfully executed by himself under the greatest possible discouragement and disadvantage but the injustice manifested towards the late Earl of Dundonald did not end here. Driven from the service of his own country and without fortune, he was compelled by his necessities to embark in the service of foreign states. With his own hand, directed by his own genius, which had to supply the place of adequate naval force, he liberated Chile, Peru and Brazil from thraldom, consolidating the rebellious provinces of the latter empire on so permanent a basis that its internal peace has never again been disturbed. Yet not one of these states has to this day satisfied the stipulated and indisputable arrangements by which he was induced to espouse their cause, the reason of their breach of contract being distinctly traceable to the course pursued towards Lord Dundonald in England, seeing that the British government paid no attention to the yet more important claims he had upon its gratitude, the South American states believed that they might with impunity disregard their own stipulations and the dictates of national honour. The chief of one of them, having had the audacity to tell Lord Cochrane that he would find no sympathy in the British government. Three of the most distinguished officers in the British service, Sir Thomas Hastings, Sir John Burgoyne, and Colonel Calhoun, have felt it their duty when officially reporting on the efficacy of Lord Dundonald's war plans to give him the highest credit for having kept his secret under peculiarly trying circumstances and from pure love of his native country. The trying circumstances were these, that he had been driven from the service of that country by the machinations of a political faction, which in the conscientious performance of his parliamentary duties he had offended. Even this injury, which blasted his whole life and prospects, did not distract one iota from the love of country, 
which to the day of his death was with him a passion, his acute mind, well knowing how to draw the distinction between his country and those who were sacrificing its best interests to their love of power, if not less worthy purposes. Never was praise more honourably given than in the ordnance report of the above-named distinguished officers, and never was it more nobly deserved. Another peculiarly trying circumstance alluded to by those officers was that, when compelled by actual pecuniary necessity, in consequence of the deprivation of his rank and pay, and the demands of increasing family, to accept service under a foreign state as his only means of subsistence, he lay before the castles of Carlo, into which had been removed for security the whole wealth of the rich capital of Peru, including bullion and plate estimated at upwards of a million sterling, he preserved his war secret, though strongly urged to put it in execution. Had he listened to the temptation, in six hours the whole of that wealth must have been in his possession, for not listening to it, he incurred the enmity of his employers, who urged that they were entitled to all his professional skill and knowledge as part of his bargain with them, and his non-compliance with their wishes is doubtless amongst the chief reasons why they have not, to this day, satisfied their own offered stipulations for his services. Yet at the very moment when he was displaying this self-sacrificing patriotism, lest his country might suffer from his secret being divulged, the government of Great Britain had, at the suggestion of the Spanish government, passed a Foreign Enlistment Act with the express intention of enveloping him in its measures. Footnote. On Lord Cochrane's return from Brazil, having occasion to go before the Attorney General on the subject of a patent, that learned functionary rudely asked him whether he was not afraid to appear in his presence. Lord Cochrane's reply was, No, nor in the presence of any man living. Evidence exists that the Attorney General asked the Ministry if he should prosecute Lord Cochrane under the Foreign Enlistment Act, the reply being in the negative. End of Appendix 1 Recording by Timothy Ferguson, Gold Coast, Australia Appendix 2 of The Life of Thomas Lord Cochrane, 10th Earl of Dundonald, Volume 1, by Henry Richard Fox Bourne. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Timothy Ferguson. Appendix 2. As a striking instance of Lord Cochrane's method of exposing naval abuses, part of a speech delivered by him in the House of Commons on the 11th of May, 1809, is here copied from his autobiography, Volume 2, pages 142 to 144. Quote, an admiral worn out in the service is superannuated at £410 a year, a captain at £210, a clerk of the ticket office requires on £700 a year. The widow of Admiral Sir Andrew Mitchell has one-third of the allowance given to the widow of a commissioner of the Navy. I will give the house another instance. Four daughters of the gallant Captain Courtney have £12.10 ten shillings each. The daughter of Sir Andrew Mitchell has £25. Two daughters of Admiral Epworth have £25 each. The daughter of Admiral Keppel, £25. The daughter of Captain Mann, who was killed in action, £25. Four children of Admiral Moriarty, £25 each. That is, 13 daughters of admirals and captains, several of whose fathers fell in the service of their country, received from the gratitude of the nation a sum less than Dame Mary Saxton, the widow of a commissioner. The pension list is not formed on any comparative rank or merit, length of service, or other rational principle, but appears to me to be dependent on parliamentary influence alone. Lieutenant Ellison, who lost his arm, is allowed £91, 5 shillings. Captain Johnston, who lost his arm, has only £45, 12 shillings and sixpence. Lieutenant Arden, who lost his arm, has £9, 5 shillings. Lieutenant Campbell, who lost his leg, £40, and poor Lieutenant Chambers, who lost both his legs, has only £80, whilst Sir A. S. Hammond retires on £1,500 per annum. The brave Sir Samuel Hood, who lost his arm, has only £500, while the late Secretary of the Admiralty retires in full health on a pension of £1,500 per annum. To speak less in detail, 32 flag officers, 22 captains, 50 lieutenants, 180 masters, 36 surgeons, 23 purses, 91 boatswains, 97 gunners, 202 carpenters and 41 cooks, in all 774 persons, cost the country £4,028, less than the net proceeds of the sinecures of Lords Arden, £20,358, Camden, £20,536, and Buckingham, £20,000.
£20,693. All the superannuated admirals, captains, and lieutenants put together have but £1,012 more than Earl Camden's sinecure alone. All that is paid to the wounded officers of the whole British Navy and to the wives and children of those dead or killed in action do not amount by £214 to as much as Lord Arden's sinecure alone is £20,358. What is paid to the mutilated officers themselves is but half as much. Is this justice? Is this the treatment which the officers of the Navy deserve at the hands of those who call themselves His Majesty's Government? Does the country know of this injustice? Will this, too, be defended? If I express myself with warmth, I trust in the indulgence of the House. I cannot suppress my feelings. Should 31 commissioners, commissioners' wives, and clerks have £3,899 more amongst them than all the wounded officers of the Navy of England? I find upon examination that the Wellesleys received from the public £34,729, a sum equal to 426 pairs of lieutenant's legs, calculated at the rate of allowance of Lieutenant Chambers' legs. Calculating for the pension of Captain Johnston's arm, viz. £45, Lord Arden's sinecure is equal to the value of 1,022 captain's arms. The Marquess of Buckingham's sinecure alone will maintain the whole ordinary establishment of the victualling department of Chatham, Dover, Gibraltar, Sheerness, Downs, Heligoland, Cork, Malta, Mediterranean, Cape of Good Hope, Rio de Janeiro, and leave £5,460 in the Treasury. Two of these comfortable sinecures would victual the officers and men serving in all the ships in ordinary in Great Britain, viz. 117 sail of the line, 105 frigates, 27 sloops, and 50 hulks. Three of them would maintain the dockyard establishments at Portsmouth and Plymouth. The addition of a few more would amount to as much as the whole ordinary establishments of the Royal Dockyards at Chatham, Woolwich, Deptford, and Sheerness, whilst the sinecures and officers executed wholly by deputy would more than maintain the ordinary establishment of all the Royal Dockyards in the Kingdom. Even Mr. Ponsonby who lately made so pathetic an appeal to the good sense of the people of England, against whom he was pleased to term demagogues, actually receives, for having been thirteen months in office, a sum equal to nine admirals who have spent their lives in the service of their country, three times as much as all the pensions given to all the daughters and children of all the admirals, captains, lieutenants, and other officers who have died in indigent circumstances or who have been killed in the service. End of Appendix 2. Recording by Timothy Ferguson, Gold Coast, Australia. Appendix 3 of The Life of Thomas, Lord Cochrane, 10th Earl of Dundonald, Volume 1, by Henry Richard Fox Bourne. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Timothy Ferguson. Appendix 3. The following letter, too long to be quoted in the body of the work, but too important to be omitted, was addressed by Lord Cochrane to the Brazilian Secretary of State. It gives memorable evidence of the treatment to which he was subjected by the Portuguese faction in Brazil. Rio de Janeiro, May the 3rd, 1824. Most Excellent Sir, I have the honour of Your Excellency's reply to my letter of the 30th of March, and as I am thereby taught that the subjects on which I wrote are not now considered so intimately connected with Your Excellency's department as they were by your immediate predecessor, nor even so far relevant as to justify a direct communication to Your Excellency, I should feel it my duty to avoid troubling you farther on those subjects, were it not that you, at the same time, have freely expressed such opinions with respect to my conduct and motives, as justice to myself requires me to controvert and refute. With regard to Your Excellency's assurance that it has ever been the intention of His Imperial Majesty and Council to act favourably towards me, I can, in return, assure Your Excellency that I have never doubted the just and benign intention of His Imperial Majesty himself, neither have I doubted that a part of his Privy Council has thought well of my services, and if I have imagined that a majority has been prejudiced against me, I have formed that conclusion merely from the effects which I have seen and experienced, and not from any undue prepossession against particular individuals, whether Brazilian or Portuguese. But when Your Excellency adds that such transactions between the late minister and myself, which, 
owing to their having been conducted verbally, have been ill understood, have been invariably decided in a manner favourably to me, I confess myself at a loss to understand Your Excellency's meaning, not having any recollection of such favourable decisions, and therefore not feeling myself competent either to admit or deny, unless in the first place Your Excellency shall be pleased to descend to particulars. I do indeed recollect that the late ministers, professing to have the authority of His Imperial Majesty, and which, from the personal countenance I have experienced from that august personage, I am sure they did not clandestinely assume, proffered to me the command of the Imperial Squadron with every privilege, emolument, and advantage which I possessed in the command of the Navy of Chile, and this Your Excellency is desired to observe was not a verbal transaction, but a written one, and therefore not liable to any of those misunderstandings to which verbal transactions, as Your Excellency observes, are naturally subject. Now in Chile my commission was that of Commander-in-Chief of the Squadron, without limitation as to time or any other restriction. <clears throat> My command, of course, was only to cease by my own voluntary resignation, or by sentence of court-martial, or by death or other uncontrollable event. And accordingly, the appointment which I accepted in the service of His Imperial Majesty, and in virtue of which I sailed in command of the expedition to Bahia, was the commander-in-chief of the whole squadron without limitation as to time or otherwise. And this, too, Your Excellency will be pleased to observe, was not a verbal transaction, but a solemn engagement in writing, bearing date the 26th of March, 1823, and now in my possession. I had also the assurance in writing of the Minister of Marine that the formalities of engrossment and registration of such appointment were only deferred from want of time, and should be executed immediately after my return. And now I most respectfully put it home to Your Excellency whether these engagements have or have not been fully confirmed and complied with under the present administration. I ask Your Excellency whether the patent which I received bearing the date the 25th November 1823 did not contain a clause of limitation by which I might at any time be dismissed from the service under any pretense or without any pretense whatever, without even the form of a hearing in my own defence. Then again, I ask Your Excellency whether my officer's commander-in-chief of the squadron was not reduced for a period of three months, as appears by every official communication of the Minister of Marine to me during that period, to the command only of the vessels of war anchored in this port. Reader's note footnote. This was resorted to in order to prevent Lord Cochrane from stationing the cruisers to annoy the enemy, to deprive him of any interest in future captures, and prevent his opposition to the unlawful restoration of the enemy's property. Footnote ends. Letter continues. And further on this subject, I ask Your Excellency whether, after my repeated remonstrances, Against this injurious limitation of my stipulated authority, it was not pretended by the decree published in the Gazette of the 28th February that I was then for the first time as a mark of special favour, elevated to the rank of Commander-in-Chief of the Squadron, and that too during the period only of the existing war, although nothing less than the Chief Command had been offered to me at the first without any restriction as to time, and although it was only in that capacity I had consented to enter into the service, and under a written appointment, as such I had then been in the service nearly twelve months. And then I ask Your Excellency whether the limitation introduced into the patent of the 25th of November last, in violation of the original agreement and confirmed and defined by the decree, published on the 28th of February following, to which may be added the communication which I received from Your Excellency, excluding me from taking the oath and becoming a party to the Constitution, the 149th article of which provides for the protection of officers until lawfully deprived by sentence of court-martial, I say that I respectfully ask Your Excellency whether these proceedings were not well adapted for the purpose of casting me off with the utmost facility at the earliest moment that convenience might dictate, either with or without the admission of those claims for the future to which past services are usually considered entitled, as might best suit the inclination of those with whom my dismissal might originate. And is it not most probable that their inclination would run counter to those claims, especially when it is considered that my letter of the 6th of March to the Minister of Marine, in which I made the inquiry whether my right to half pay would be recognised on the termination of the war, has never been answered, although my application for a reply was repeated? Reader's note, footnote, an answer was at last given, a few days before Lord Cochrane's assistance was called for to put down the revolution at Pernambuco, and half of the originally granted half-pay was decreed when he should return, after the termination of hostilities, to his native country. Reader's note, footnote ends, letter continues. If, then, the explicit engagements in writing between the late Minister of His Imperial Majesty and myself have, as I have shown, 
been set aside by the present ministry and council, and other arrangements far less favourable to me, and destructive of the lawful security of my present and future rights, have, without my consent, been substituted in their stead, where, I entreat your excellency, am I to look for those favourable constructions of, quote, ill-understood verbal transactions, end quote, which your excellency requires me to accept as a proof that the intentions of the present ministry and council, in respect to me, have ever been of the most favourable and obliging nature. I would beg permission, too, to inquire how it happened that the portarias, reader's note, footnote, official communications, end footnote, from the Minister of Marine, charging me unjustly from time to time with neglecting to obey the command of His Imperial Majesty, were constantly made public, while my answers in refutation were always suppressed, and why, when I remonstrated against this injustice, was I answered that the same course should be persisted in, and that I had no alternative but to acquiesce, or to descend to a newspaper controversy by publishing my exculpations myself. Is it possible not to perceive that the ex parte publication of these accusatory portarias was intended to lower me in the public estimation and to prepare the way for the exercise of that power of summary dismissal which was so unfairly acquired by the means above described. On the subject of the prizes, Your Excellency is pleased to state la difficulté servants de judgment de prise en et du en ou des motifs si connus et positifs quil est essais de l'ore de la voix attribué à la mauvaise volonté du conseil de SMI, end quote. To this I reply that I know of no just cause for the delay which has arisen in the decision of the prizes, and consequently I have the right to impute blame for that delay to those who have the power to cause it or remove it. If the majority of voices in council had been for a prompt condemnation to the captors of the prizes taken from the Portuguese nation, is it possible that individuals of that nation would have been suffered to continue to be the judges of those prizes after an experience of many months has demonstrated either their determination to do nothing or nothing favourable to their captors. The repugnance of Portuguese judges to condemn property captured from their fellow countrymen as a reward to those who have engaged in hostilities against Portugal is natural enough, and is the only well-known and positive cause of the delay with which I am acquainted. But it is not such a cause for delay as ought to have been permitted to operate by the ministers and council of His Imperial Majesty, who are bound in honour and duty, to act with fidelity toward those who have been engaged as auxiliaries in the attainment and maintenance of the independence of the empire. I did, however, inform Your Excellency that I had heard it stated that another difficulty had arisen in the apprehension that this government might be under the necessity of eventually restoring the prizes to the original Portuguese owners as a condition of peace. But this, Your Excellency assures me, proves nothing but that I am a listener to rapporteurs whom I ought to drive from my presence." Unfortunately, however, for this bold explanation of Your Excellency, the individual whom I heard make the observation was no other than His Excellency, the present Minister of Marine, Francisco Villala Barbosa. If Your Excellency considers that gentleman in the light of a rapporteur or tale-bearer, it is not for me to object, but the imputation of being a listener to or encourager of tale-bearers so rashly advanced by Your Excellency against me is without foundation in truth. It may be necessary for ministers of state to have their eavesdroppers and informers, but mine is a straightforward course which needs no such precautions, and if there are any who volunteer information or advice, I can appreciate the value of it and the motives of those who offer it. Those who know me much better than Your Excellency does will admit that I am in the habit of thinking for myself, and not apt to act on the suggestions of others, especially if officiously tendered. As to the successive appointment and removal of incompetent auditors of marine, for which Your Excellency gives credit to the Council, I can only say that the benefit of such repeated changes is by no means apparent, and to revert again to the difficulty of decision, for which Your Excellency intimates there is a sufficient cause, I beg leave to ask Your Excellency what just reason can exist for not condemning these prizes to the captors. Can it be denied that the orders under which I sailed for the blockade of Bahia authorised me to act hostilely against the ships and property of the Crown and subjects of Portugal? Can it be denied that war was regularly declared between the two nations? Was it not even promulgated under the sanction of His Imperial Majesty in a document giving to privateers certain privileges, which, it is admitted, were possessed by the ships of war in the making and sale of captures? And yet did not the prize tribunal, consisting chiefly, as I observed, of Portuguese, on the return of the squadron eight months afterwards, pretend to be ignorant whether His Imperial Majesty was at war or at peace with the Kingdom of Portugal, 
and did they not, under that pretense, avoid proceeding to adjudication? Was not this pretense a false one, or is it one of those well-founded causes of difficulty to which your excellency alludes? Can it be denied that the squadron sailed and acted in the full expectation, grounded on the assurance and engagements of the government, that all captures made under the flag of the enemy, whether ships of war or merchant vessels, were to be prize to the captors? And yet, when the prize judges were at length under the necessity of commencing proceedings, did they not endeavour to set aside the claims of the captors by their monstrous pretense that they had no interest in their captures when made within the distance of two leagues from the shore? Will your excellency contend that this was a good and sufficient reason? Was it founded in common sense or on any rational precedent, or indeed any precedent whatsoever? Was it either honest to the squadron or faithful to the country? Was it calculated to prevent the squadron from ever again assailing an invading enemy or again expelling him from the shores of the empire? Then, in the next place, did not these extraordinary judges pretend that at least all vessels taken in ports and harbours should be condemned as droits to the crown and not as prize to the captors? Was this not another most pernicious attempt to deprive the imperial squadron not only of its reward for the past, but of any adequate motive for the risk of future enterprise, and in effect were not these successive pretenses calculated to operate as invitations to invasions? Did they not tend to encourage the enemy to resume his occupation of the port of Bahia, and generally to renew his aggressions against the independence of the empire, on her shores and in her ports, without the probability of resistance by the squadrons of his imperial majesty? And have not these same judges actually condemned almost every prize as adroit to the crown, thereby doing as much in them lay to defraud the squadron and to damp its zeal and destroy its energies. Nay, have not the auditors of marine actually issued decrees pronouncing the captures made at Maranjo to have been illegal, alleging they were seized under the Brazilian flag, although in truth the flag of the enemy was flying at the time both in forts and ships, declaring me a violator of the law of nations and the law of the land, accusing me of having been guilty of an insult to the emperor and the empire, and decreeing costs and damages against me under these infamous pretenses. Can your excellency perceive either justice or decency in these decrees? Do they, in any degree, breathe the spirit of gratitude for the union of so important a province to the empire, or are they at all in accordance with the distinguished approbation which his imperial majesty himself has evinced of my services at Marano? Can it be unknown to your excellency that the late ministers, acting doubtless under the sanction of his imperial majesty, and assuredly under the guidance of common sense, held out that the value of ships of war taken from the enemy was to be the reward of the enterprise of the captors, and yet are we not now told that a law exists decreeing all captured men of war to the crown, and so rendering the engagements of the late ministers illegal and nugatory? Can anything be more contrary to justice, to good faith, to common sense, or to sound policy? Was it ever expected by any government employing foreign seamen in a war in which they can have no personal rights at stake, that those seamen will incur the risk of attacking a superior, or even an equal, force, without a prospect of other reward than their ordinary pay? Is it not notorious that even in England it is found essential, or at least highly advantageous, to reward the officers and seamen, though fighting their own battles, not only with the full value of captured vessels of war, but even with additional premiums? And was it ever doubted that such liberal policy has mainly contributed to the surpassing magnitude of the naval power of that little island, and her consequent greatness as a nation. Can your excellency deny that the delay, the neglect, and the conduct generally of the prize judges have been the cause of an immense diminution in the value of the captures? Have not the consequences been a wanton and shameful waste of property by decay and plunder? Can your excellency really believe in the existence of a good and sufficient motive for consigning such property to destruction, rather than at once awarding it to the captors, in recompense for their services to the empire? Is it not true that all control over the sails and cargoes of the vessels, most of which are without invoices, have been taken from the captors and their agents, and placed in the hands of individuals over whom they have no authority or influence, and from whom they can have no security of receiving a just account? And can it be doubted that the gracious intentions of his imperial majesty, as announced by himself, of rewarding the captors with the value of the prizes, are in the utmost danger of being defeated by such proceedings? Since the twelfth day of February, when his imperial majesty was graciously pleased 
to signify his pleasure in his own handwriting, that the prizes, though condemned to the crown, should be paid for to the captors, and that valuators should be appointed to estimate the amount, is it not true that nothing whatever, up to the date of my former letter to your excellency, had been done by his ministers and council, in furtherance of such gracious intentions? On the contrary, is it not notorious that, since the announcement of the imperial intention, numerous vessels and cargoes have been arbitrarily disposed of by authority of the auditors of marine by being delivered to pretended owners and others without legal adjudication and even without the decency of acquainting the captors or their agents that the property had been so transferred and has not the whole cost of litigation watching and guarding the vessels and cargoes been entirely at the expense of the captors notwithstanding the disposal of the property and the receipt of the proceeds by the agents of government and others. So little hope of justice has been presented by the proceedings of the prize tribunal that it has appeared quite useless to label the stores found in the naval and military arsenals of Maranjo or the $66,000 in the chests of the Treasury and Custom House with double that sum in bills, all of which was left for the use of the province or permitted to be disimbursed to satisfy the clamorous troops of Chiara and Piani. Has any remuneration been offered to the Navy for these sacrifices, of which ministers were duly informed by my official dispatches, or has any recompense been awarded for the Portuguese brig and schooner of war, both completely stored and equipped, which were surrendered at Maranjo, and which have ever since been employed in the naval service? To a proportion of all of this, I should have been entitled in Chile as well as in the English service, and why, I ask, must I here be contented to be deprived of every hope of these fruits of my labours, in addition to the prize vessels delivered to claimants without trial, have not the ministers appropriated others to the uses of the state without valuation or recompense? Reader's note footnote. This conduct was afterwards more flagrantly exemplified on the arrival of the new and noble prize figate Imperatrice, the equipment whereof had cost the captors 12,000 mil rears, which sum has never been returned. Reader's note footnote ends. In short, is it not true that though more than a year has elapsed since the sailing of the Imperial Squadron under my command, and nearly half a year since its return, after succeeding in expelling the naval and military forces of the enemy from Bayer, and liberating the northern provinces, and uniting them to the Empire, I say, is it not true that not one shilling of prize money has yet been distributed to the squadron, and that no prospect is even now apparent of any distribution being speedily made. Is it not true that the only substantial reward of the officers and seamen of the squadron for the important services that they have rendered has hitherto been nothing more than their mere pittance of ordinary pay, and even that in many instances vexatiously delayed and miserably curtailed, and with respect to myself individually, is it not notorious that I necessarily consume my whole pay in my current expenses, that my official rank cannot be upheld with less, and that it is wholly inadequate to the due support of the dignity of those high honours which His Imperial Majesty has been graciously pleased to confer? Under all these circumstances, it is in vain that I endeavour to make that discovery which Your Excellency assures me requires only a moment's reflection." Or rest, your excellency says, Quevi exe reflexis un moment, cela trouverait que le gouvernement de SMI, simplement et uniquement, pour faire plaisir à vie, exe à cette atri on enorme responsabilité de ce engagement près avec vie, exe. It is not one moment only, nor one hour, that I have reflected on these words, but without making the promised discovery or any profitable guess at your excellency's meaning i would therefore entreat your excellency to tell me what it is that the government has engaged to do all that i know is that they have engaged to pay me a certain sum per annum as commander-in-chief of the squadron and this engagement i admit they have so far fulfilled but the amount is little more than is received by the commander-in-chief of an english squadron and is it not found in that service and in every regular or established naval service that for one officer qualified for any considerable command, there are probably ten that are not qualified, though all have necessarily been reared and paid at the national expense. Whereas in this case, so far from your having been at the expense of money in order to procure a few that are effective, 
you obtained at once, without any previous cost whatsoever, the services of myself and the officers that accompanied me, all of whom were experienced and efficient. Now the united amount of salaries you are engaged to pay to myself and the officers whom I brought with me does not exceed $25,000 a year. To speak of this as an enormous responsibility, as an empire, requires more than a moment's reflection to be clearly understood. The government did, however, engage to pay myself and my brother officers and seamen the value of our captures from the enemy pursuant to the practice of all maritime belligerents, but this engagement has not hitherto been fulfilled. If, however, your excellency admits the responsibility of the government to fulfil this engagement also, I am still equally at a loss to conceive in what sense that responsibility could be considered enormous, inasmuch as these prizes were not the property of the state, nor of individuals belonging to this nation, but were the property of Portugal, with whom this nation was, and is, engaged in lawful war. The payment, therefore, of the value of these prizes to the captors, supposing even the full value to be paid, does not, in effect, take one penny out of the national treasury, or out of the pocket of any Brazilian. If it be false, and your excellency appears to scout the idea that any danger exists of having to pay twice for these prizes, if there really is no danger of being compelled to purchase peace with a defeated enemy by restoring them their forfeited property, it follows that the responsibility of the government in fulfilling its engagement with the captors is so far from being enormous that it is literally nothing. How the fulfilment of a lawful engagement by the simple act of paying over to the squadron the value of its prizes taken in time of war from the foreign enemies of the state, such payment occasioning no expense and no loss to the state itself, can be attended with an enormous responsibility, I am utterly unable to comprehend. So far as the engagements of the government with me, or with the captors in general of the Portuguese prizes, are of a pecuniary nature, they appear to me to lay no great weight of responsibility on the Herculean shoulders of this vast empire, and it is only in a pecuniary sense that I can conceive it to be possible for your excellency to have thought of complaining of the responsibility attending the fulfilment of the engagements of the government with me. It is no less difficult to comprehend how this supposed enormous responsibility has been incurred. Simplement et uniquement pour faire plaisir to me, and it is still more difficult to comprehend how it happens that your excellency, after all you have heard and seen, après ce qui je entendu et vous, should be at a loss to know in what manner I am to be contented. Je ne serai pas de quelle manière en peace vous contenter. If, indeed, your excellency imagines I ought to be contented with honorary distinctions alone, however highly I may prize them as the free gift of his imperial majesty, if your excellency is of the opinion that I ought with rebursement as satisfaction to put up with those honours in lieu of those stipulated substantial rewards, which even those honours render more necessary, if your excellency thinks that I ought, like the dog in the fable, to resign the substance for a grasp at the shadow, if this is all that your excellency knows on the subject of giving me content, it is then very true that your excellency does not know in what manner it is to be done. But if, quote, after all your excellency has heard and seen, end quote, you would be pleased to render yourself conversant with those written engagements under which I was induced to enter into the service, all that your excellency and the rest of the ministers and council of his imperial majesty would then have to do in order to content me to the full would be to desist from evading the performance of those engagements and to cause them at once to be fully and honourably fulfilled. And I do not believe that my, quote, correspondence official unfair rendu public and fair a foy, end quote, for I am not conscious that I have ever called on the government to incur one farthing of expense on my account beyond the fulfilment of their written engagements, which were the same as those I had with Chile, which were formed precisely on the practice of England. There was indeed a verbal and conditional engagement with the late ministers that certain losses which I might incur in the consequence of leaving the service of Chile should be made good. Reader's note footnote. As the Brazilian government had obtained possession of a new corvette, named the Maria de Gloria, which cost the government of Chile $90,000, without reimbursing to that state one single farthing, and by the said act had deprived Lord Cochrane of the benefit he would have derived as commander-in-chief from the services of that ship in the Pacific. The non-fulfilment of this engagement seems more unjust. 
Reader's note footnote ends. Letter continues. And the question as to the obligation of fulfilling that engagement I submitted in my letter of the 6th of March to the Minister of Marine to the consideration of their successors. It would be fortunate for me if this should prove to be one of those ill-understood verbal transactions which Your Excellency assures me the present ministers and council always decide in my favour. I shall not in that case be backward to receive the benefit of the decision with thanks and satisfaction, but I am willing to resign it rather than it should add an overwhelming weight to that enormous responsibility which Your Excellency complains has already been incurred with a view to my contentment. I repeat that I have never asked for more than I possessed in Chile, or than any officer of the same rank is entitled to in England, though British officers have heretofore received in the service of Portugal double the amount of their English pay, and though the burning climate of Brazil is injurious to health, while those of Chile and Portugal are salubrious. Your Excellency, therefore, is perfectly welcome to publish the whole of my official correspondence, because instead of proving, as Your Excellency asserts, the great difficulty of contenting me, it would go far to prove the much greater difficulty of inducing those with whom I have to do to take any one step for that purpose. I confess, however, that in order to content me effectually, it is necessary to fulfil not only all written engagements with myself individually, but generally with all the officers and seamen with whom, while I hold the command, I consider myself identified, and the more particularly because, in my own firm reliance on the good faith of the government, I did in some sort become responsible for that good faith to my brother officers and seamen, but with whom, I put it to your excellency, has good faith been kept. Is it not notorious that previous to the departure of the expedition to Bahia, declarations were made to the seamen in writing by the late Minister of Marine, through my medium and in printed proclamations, that their dues should be paid with all possible regularity, and all their arrears discharged immediately on their return. And is not your Excellency aware that specific contracts were entered into by the accredited agent of His Imperial Majesty in England, with a number of officers and seamen who, in consequence, were induced to quit their native country and enter into the employ of His Imperial Majesty? Can it be denied that these declarations and contracts written and printed were known to and are actually in the possession of the ministers or in the hands of the officers of the pay department and yet is it not true that they were neglected to be fulfilled for a period of upwards of three months after the return of the Pedro Primiero, and was not the tardy fulfilment which at length took place procured by my incessant representations and remonstrances? Permit me also to ask whether the good effects of prompt payment were not illustrated on the arrival of the frigates Nitheroy and Carolyn, which happened just at the period I had succeeded in procuring payment to be made. Was it not in consequence of immediate payment that the greater part of the English crew of the Nitheroy remained quietly on board, and are now actually engaged on an important service to his Imperial Majesty? And on the other hand, is it not equally true that the English seamen of the Pedro Primiero were so disheartened and disgusted with the long delay which in their case had occurred, and the manifest bad faith which had been evinced, that by far the greater part of them actually abandoned the ship, and generally, is it not true that the violations of promise the obstruction of justice and the arbitrary acts of severity have produced dissatisfaction and irritation in the minds of the officers and seamen and done infinite prejudice to the service of his imperial majesty and to the interests and prospects of the empire can it be denied that the treatment to which the officers are exposed is in the highest degree cruel and unjust have they not in many instances been confined in a fortress or prison ship without being told who is their accuser or what is the accusation and are they not kept for many months at a time in that cruel state of suspense and restraint without the means or opportunity of justification or defence? Have not some of them, while incarcerated in the fortress of the island of Cobras, been deprived of their pay for a great length of time and even denied the provisions necessary for their subsistence? And if, after all, they are brought to trial, are not their judges composed of the natives of a nation with whom they are at war? Is it possible that English or other foreign officers in the service can be satisfied with such a system. Can Your Excellency entertain a doubt that open accusation, prompt trial, unsuspected justice, and speedy punishment, if merited, are essential to the good government of a naval service? Nay, is it possible that Your Excellency should not know the system of government in the naval service of Portugal is the most wretched in the world, and consequently the last that ought to have been adopted for the naval service of Brazil?
and here I would respectfully ask your excellency whether you know of any one thing recommended by me for the benefit of the naval service being complied with. Have the laws been revised to adapt them to the better government of the service? Has a corps of marine artillery been formed and taught their duty? Have young gentlemen intended for officers been sent on board to learn their profession? Have young men been enlisted and sent on board to be bred up as seamen? Or has any encouragement been given to the employment of Brazilians in the commerce of the coast? Readers note footnote. It was the policy of Portugal to navigate the coasting trade of Brazil by slaves, and that of Spain to allow none but Indians to exercise the trade of fishermen on the shores of their South American colonies. Readers note footnote ends, letter continues. With regard to those difficulties, delays, and other impediments of which I have complained as existing in the arsenal and other officers, and which Your Excellency supposes me to have represented as being caused, or at least tolerated, by the minister, and which you are pleased to characterise as to defend imaginaires at neant de autre sorsque the ambition sordid de quelque intrigant, I shall not now enter into them again at any length, as much that I have already written tends to refute your excellency's notions on the subject. That such abuses really do exist, I have proved beyond the power of contradiction, and that they are at least tolerated by those, whomever they may be, who possess, without exercising, the means of preventing, does not require the ingenuity of an intrigant to discover, as the fact is self-evident. I cannot, therefore, admit that either my complaints or suspicions are tout à fait imaginaires, or that they are des petitesses, as Your Excellency is pleased, contemptuously, to term them. But whatever they are, they originate in my own observation, without any assistance, from the spectacles of an intrigant, with which I am so gratuitously accommodated by Your Excellency. In still further proof, however, of the real existence of the evils in question, I may just observe that since the return of the Pedro Primiero, that ship has been kept in constant disorder by the delay in commencing, and the idle and negligent mode of executing, even the trifling alterations in the channels which were necessary to enable the rigging to be set up, and which, after the lapse of upward of five months, is now scarcely finished, though it might have been accomplished in 48 hours. Even the time of caulking was spun out to a period nearly as long as was occupied last year in the accomplishment of that thorough repair which the ship then underwent, and the painting is far from being completed after 16 or 18 days' labour, though a British ship of war is usually painted in a day. Even my own cabin is in such a state that when I am on board, I have no place to sit down in. All these things may appear to Your Excellency as des petitesses, or even tout à fait imaginaires, but to me they appear matters of a serious nature, injurious and disgraceful to the service. I may not perhaps succeed in convincing Your Excellency, but I have the satisfaction of being inwardly conscious that, independent of my natural desire to obtain justice for myself and for all the officers and men of the squadron, no small part of my anxiety for the fulfilment of the engagements of the government proceeds from a desire to see the navy of His Imperial Majesty rendered efficient, which it can never be unless the same good faith is observed with the officers and men as is kept between the government and navy of England, and unless indeed many other important considerations are attended to which appear to have hitherto escaped the regard of the imperial government. Why, for instance, is there indifference in regard to the clothing of the men? What but discontent, debasement, and enervation can the effects of that ragged and almost naked condition in which they have so long been suffered to remain, notwithstanding the numerous applications that have been made for necessary clothing? I would also inquire the reason that officers and men, strangers to each other and destitute of attachment and mutual confidence, are hastily shipped together in vessels of war going on active service, when better arrangements might easily be made. What can be expected from the vessels of war just gone out, in case they should meet with any serious opposition, but disgrace to those by whom they were so imperfectly and improperly equipped. If this communication were not already too long, or if after the letter I have received from Your Excellency it were possible for me to continue my representations in the hope of redress, I could add to the list of those causes of complaint which I had already pointed out many particulars, which none but those who are blindly attached to that wretched system which has been so injurious to the marine and kingdom of Portugal could consider either trifling or imaginary. But as my present object has been chiefly to repel those imputations in which Your Excellency has so freely indulged, and believing that I have fully succeeded in that object, and have shown clearly that Your Excellency has unjustly and untruly accused me of encouraging tale-bearers, 
making unfounded complaints, and of being of a nature so avaricious as never to be satisfied, which latter, by the by, is an extraordinary accusation to prefer against me, a man whom your excellency must know has not hitherto been benefited, after being more than a year in the service, to the amount of one shilling for the important services he has rendered, but who, on the contrary, as he can show by his accounts, has necessarily expended more in his official situation than he has received in the service, so that the remerciments and the satisfaction which your excellency accuses him of being deficient in can scarcely yet be due, unless it is proper to be satisfied and grateful too, for less than nothing, having, I say, fully repelled and refuted these unjust accusations, I shall avoid troubling your excellency with any further detail, but I repeat that your excellency has my free consent to cause the whole of my official correspondence to be published, for in all that I have advanced with respect to the violations of contracts and on the subject of the unsatisfied claims of the squadron and relative to the ill usage of officers under arrest and to the misconduct of the judges of prizes and those who have the management of the civil department of the marine, who does note footnote also Portuguese, footnote ends, and in all matters whatever in question between the government of Brazil and myself, I am confident that I may safely rely on the decision of the public. And if at the same time your excellency can give me a satisfactory explanation of the motives of that line of conduct on the part of the ministers and council which without such explanation would have the appearance of originating in bad faith the publication would be doubly beneficial by placing the conduct and character of all parties in a proper point of view i have the honour to be most excellent sir your respectful and most obedient servant cochrane and moranum his excellency joao seriano maciel de costa secretary of state for the home department etc 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 end of appendix three end of the life of thomas lord cochrane tenth earl of dundonald volume one by henry richard foxbourne